Wir werden heute Abend über die Gesundheitssysteme und die Zerstörung äh, der Gesundheitssysteme durch die Austeritätspolitik in Griechenland und in Spanien reden und mit Sophie Blanke aus Belgien über die Bewegung Médecins pour le Peuple. Darüber wird sie erzählen, was, was das genau ist. Ähm, wir haben uns das so gedacht, jeder von den dreien, die hier neben mir sitzen, wird 20 Minuten sprechen, dann haben wir ungefähr eine Stunde um und dann haben wir noch mal eine Stunde für Diskussion. Hier neben mir, links von mir, sitzt Alexis Benus, Arzt und äh, Professor für Sozialmedizin und äh, Primary Health in Thessaloniki in Griechenland und auch Mitglied der Solidarischen Praxis in Thessaloniki. Links von ihm sitzt Luis Daniel Martin aus Madrid, ein Journalist und Gründungsmitglied der Maria Blanca, der Weißen Welle, einer Widerstandsbewegung, die das Gesundheitswesen thematisiert in Spanien. Dazu wird er noch was sagen. Und ganz links sitzt Sophie Blanke aus Antwerpen, Ärztin für Mezzan pour le Peuple und Mitglied der Workers' Party von Belgien. So I had three questions to you. What was the Spanish health system like before crisis and what did change during the crisis? How does austerity politics look like in Spain? Does it look the same as in Greece or is there other difference? Um, the Maria Blanca, which exists since 18th November 2012, um, is resisting against these politics. What kind of resistance are you practicing and is it successful? And the third question is, you will have national elections in December this year. Um, uh, is, are there chances to change things fundamentally? What are your hopes for these elections? I hope. I hope. I think you have to speak. Um, Entschuldigung, guten Tag. Entschuldigung uh, für uh, Deutsche nicht Space. Um, ich spreche Englisch und so so. Um, mein Name ist uh, Luis Daniel Martin. I'm 42 years old. I'm a Spanish journalist and uh, for the past two and a half years I have lived with uh, leukemia, a serious cancer of the blood. My case is similar to that of more than uh, 5,000 other people in my country each year, each year who find out that uh, they have this brutal and costly disease. Until recently, the Spanish public health service covered all expenses for cancer patients and anyone in need of medical treatment, whatever their condition, regardless of origin, race, religion, capacity to work, finance, or even their legal right to be in the country. But that's exactly the point, only recently. In the first decade of this century, we Spaniards had a public health service that more than almost any other national achievement we were truly proud of it. It was good, it worked, it was affordable. Its quality was undeniable and internationally recognized. Spanish health professionals were always among the best in the world for health-related issues, issues. It was universal and it showed solidarity. And for our test, every Spaniard contributed to financing, financing the public health service to keep in that way. And it was cheap, undeniably cheap. According to a report published by Eurostart, Spain spends 1,463 euros per capita on health. 631 less than the average of the Eurozone, which stands at 2,094 euros per person. 
It is true for for years, especially in the late 90s, Spain became a sort of health tourist destination. People from all over the world, from all over Europe and many other parts of the world would come to my country to cure their, uh, their ailments completely free of charge. However, the fact remains that the solution should never be to restrict the freedoms of privatized service. The solution should have come about through improvements to public health in the country of origin. The European Union and international organizations should have allocated more money to prevention, to health protection, and deserves research. But this has not happened. Of course, Spain hasn't done it either. And worst of all, the economic crisis has given the politicians an excuse to implement incomprehensible cuts and make utterly shameful decisions. The main concerts served by many countries of the European Union, Spain among them, are linking to the ability of their national administrations to meet their debts, repayments, and take the necessary measures to control public spending, all while trying to promote economic growth. So, in April 2012, the Spanish government passed what it called law or urgent measures to ensure the sustainability of the national public health service and enhance the quality and safety and safety of its services, which put an end to the universality of the system and the complementarity naturi, naturi of the service it's provided. Since that day, more than a million people living in Spain have been left outside of the health system. And our elderly, our vulnerability, and those of us with chronic illness and forces to pay twice for our health service, one in taste, and then again every time we get treatment. It's so important. As uh, if there were not enough, we have gone from being the leading country in the world for organ transplants and one of the most active in stem cell research, oncology, and the study of treatment of disease of the blood to hide the absolute political ineptitude when it comes to designing a new healthcare model, one that would work for everyone and contribute to the sustainability of the public system and worse still, the government of my country, the Southern European nation with uh, is more North African from some aspect, is streaking fear into the cares of its citizens. For example, by restricting the right to access the public health service for Spaniards who spend more than 90 days abroad per year, meaning that many Erasmus students here in Berlin don't have health coverage and are forced to pay their own health care when they are already paying for all the other Spaniards, or by treating to privatize everything that our parents and grandparents fought for, that we have fought for, and that, I hope, our children, our children will fight for too, I hope. Article 43 of the Spanish Constitution recognizes the right to health protection. However, my country spends only 5.8% of 
the GDP of public health far below the EU average of 7.3%, more than the 20% of Spanish public health expenditure goes to the pharmacies uh, because of the influence of the pharmaceutical industry. When we did that, this 20% from the 5.8% of GDP, we see that non-pharmaceutical health spending stands at 4.7% of C GDP, the lowest in the European Union, together with Greece. This lack of resource goes some way in explain, explaining the serious shortcomings of the Spanish health system, ranging from the long waiting list for treatment or life treating conditions such as hair surgery operation among the longest of the European Union to the unreformed and very short appointments, times of primary care seekings, working with occupants in Barcelona, for example, who devote an average of just three minutes to each patient visit. For the Spanish authorities today, those of us with serious of chronic illness are just numbers. We are numbers. We use up large amounts of uh, state resource in many cases with minimal change of recovery. For the authorities of my country, I and patients like me are a nuisance missing up their statics, so the best thing to do is to get us out of the public health service and privatize the service we are offered so that with any luck, we don't have the money to pay for our own lives. The concept of hell knows no ideology, ideology does not known of person uh, power or social status. It knows only of people, people suffering, hoping, as I do, to one day find a donor to save their lives or conduce research so that cancer, AIDS, or diabetes can be cured forever. People to help, to help, to work, research, share, care, fight, Listen, people, only people. And so in late 2012, amid a profound economic crisis in, crisis in Spain, with the EU calling for drastic measures and the national government willing to cut public sector uh, spending, restricting the fundamental rights of the people, they said it would save uh, 7 billion euros in health spending, but uh, ended up uh, extending 10 times more. Um, in, uh, in this time arose uh, the Maria Blanca uh, grow up, white tide. This free independent committed a political social movement was made up of uh, Spanish public health workers and uh, of citizens like me, journalists, a lot of journalists in Spain, coming from uh, uh, 15 May, uh, one movement in uh, Puerta del Sol, Madrid. Um, this, uh, this movement grew up and um, we uh, start use uh, proven legal arguments to defend one of the guiding principles of our country's social and economic policy that uh, have been working perfectly well since uh, 1986, uh, the right to universal public health service. The process of this uh, modeling and privatizing healthcare began to take shape in 1991 
but uh, it was not until 2012 that Mariano Rajoy, the Spanish Premier Minister, I think the worst Premier Minister of Spain, I think, because it's, it's not, not, it's not uh, normal, the, the, his decisions, but it's my opinion, <laughs> I think. It was uh, a very good gift for, for Christmas, this uh, 20th of December, uh, the change. Um, Mariano Rajoy decided to implement it fully. In various regions, uh, local leaders began to grant, to grant dubious license and permits to business, hospitals, uh, health centers and private lab laboratories are linked in one way to another to the central government. Then the people took to the streets to defend their rights. They freely took to the streets to demand respect and common sense for the authorities. They took to the streets to fight um, um, cronyism illegal practice and the anti-social policy uh, measures uh, the government was proposing, the white type, so name uh, for the work uniforms to the healthcare staff, first uh, flooded the streets of the capital, Madrid, on the 18th of November, 2012. From that day to this, for three years about, Hundreds of protests have taken place that have prevented the Spanish government and the various regional governments from getting away with this. The privatization of healthcare has, has been met with resistance in Madrid alone, six hospitals and 27 public health uh, centers have been saved for the privatization. Uh, the irregularities committed uh, by the government issuing licenses to affiliate companies uh, has been met uh, with resistance, um, a lot of people at the streets. Inequality has been met with resistance, but it cannot be eradicated. We still have much to fight for, much to defend, much to achieve. We still have to take to the street to get rid of all those uh, who have taken advantage of our citizens, who have committed crimes of corruption or abuse of poder, power of um, all those who tried to deceive us and fail it. We started this movement. At first, there were only 12 of us, but now we are many and we are not going to give up. Not once has the Spanish Prime Minister met with us. Never has we wished to hear us out or to talk to us and try to reach a solution. Never has he shown the slightest interest in what we were asking for. Instead, whenever we organize a peaceful public demonstration, he sent the police and uh, a deterrent. At times, they even use violence with us, something that discredits any position. I'm only journalist, not uh, violence. I'm only journalist, a citizen of Spain. We will not behave like that. One of the 20th of December this year, national election will take place in Spain. And we want to ask citizens to use this election to express their rejection of the poor management and anti-social, anti-healthcare, anti-citizen government. Health is right, it's right, and we cannot allow to be used as a negotiation tactic. We must all speak out against these practices. Public health workers, citizens, and all of you as well, who will one day visit our country. Saving the knowledge 
that you can receive proper treatment in our health centers. This system serves all of us, and it affects all of us. I don't want to end my speech without asking something of you. In fact, I believe it's essential. And I refer back to the beginning of my speech. My name is Luis Daniel Martin. I am 42 years old. I'm a Spanish journalist. And for the past two and a half years, I have lived with a leukemia. I would like to ask you to help us in resisting the Spanish government, help us to ensure that austerity does not become synonymous with a lack of health care for those in need. Help us to avoid social inequalities in Europe and through the world. You, like us, are living with the Syrian refugees and they need their elder brothers in Europe to give them and care for them. I ask you also, I ask you also to show solidarity and to donate bow marrow, which could save so many lives, including mine. It's so important for us to be human people, not only numbers. Remember that the future constructed upon the foundation of the present. And thus, as Arthur Schopenhauer said, hell is not everything, but without it, everything else is nothing. Thank you so much. I was asking three questions to Alexis as well. Um, the first question was, what were the consequences of austerity politics on the Greek health system and on the health of the people in Greece? The second was, how do the solidarity clinics in Greece work? What is their political concept and how are they linked to the left movement? And the third was, what did the Syriza government change in health politics? And maybe if there's some time, or maybe for the discussion, how is the relation now after the third memorandum between the movement and Syriza? As you understand, all, uh, all these questions need uh, at least uh, two months of discussion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try today to do it uh, for today only. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I am uh, used to be here, actually. I, I know the place and uh, a lot of people of you. And I'm very glad to be with you and discuss uh, matters that are very important for Europe, I think, and especially for the European left, of course. So, the first question was, uh, and that's why I made the presentation, uh, just to rem re remember what is happening uh, in Greece in terms of data what is happening uh, due to the crisis and the austerity policies and the structural adjustment. First of all, the crisis is European, as you know. Here you see the, the red uh, line, it's the GDP in, in Europe, and the black, which is going up uh, gradually, is uh, unemployment, okay? So uh, this was the European, but in Greece, you can see Yeah, okay. In Greece, you can see, okay, the crisis GDP and unemployment rate, which now it's almost uh, 30%. It is 27 now, but anyway, it's around 30%. So the crisis in Greece is very deep, is even deeper than Spain, but we go together, of course, uh, in, the same, in the same pathway. I think uh, uh, Luis or Daniel, how do we call you? Luis Daniel, both. <laughs> uh, I think uh, Luis covered a lot uh, of my presentation in terms of uh, what is happening, so I'm not going to repeat in order to have more time for discussion, especially the crisis that is going on. So we have uh, an important uh, raise uh, all these years of unemployment, uh, which has <coughs> specific impact on health, not only unemployment, but generally the socioeconomic conditions of living. So this is uh, epidemiologically, we call it the causes of the causes of the diseases, 
which are uh, the socioeconomic causes that are the main causes of any kind of disease. Uh, for example, before finding, uh, before speaking about the microorganism that is causing a diarrhea, the cause of the cause of having this mi microorganism in the water is that there is no water safety and uh, uh, water ad adequate water for the population. So, if if we have that, we don't have the microorganisms. So that's why we are speaking about the causes of the causes. So we have a very important deterioration of health in Greece. Here you can see the infant mortality. Infant mortality is less than five years old babies, uh, children. So you can see here that uh, it is increasing after 2007, which is infant mortality is an index which is very uh, relevant and is affected by the socioeconomic uh, crisis. And here, <coughs> I'm sorry, we have the suicide rates, which are also, as you can see, uh, uh, sh in a sharp way are raising. Here, uh, we have to say that all these data are not only a Greek phenomenon. I mean, you, we have seen all this all over the world where we had crisis. The first years, we have the suicides are going up. After, they are making a plateau, which is not necessarily that this, the situation is better, but it is a kind of adaptation of, okay, we know where we are. So, you know, anyway, we are used to it. In a way, yes, yes. Anyway, so we have uh, the, 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 the uh, suicide, and also we have the infectious diseases. In, if, we, if we want to make uh, just a, a summary, quick summary, infant mortality, suicide mortality, major depression, as you can understand, it's obvious that, but it is a very important uh, issue in uh, morbidity. Uh, another issue which is very sensitive is the, 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 the use, drug users, you know, that we, are, we have a, a, a raising of drug users, which also it's a socioeconomic disease, as you know. And infectious diseases, including also the, the, the deaths of HIV people that were mainly produced by the previous government, and especially the Social Democrat uh, Minister of Health, who stopped all the, the preventive uh, and supporting uh, programs, especially giving needles for free. It was a program. And they stopped that because of economy, you know. And after that, uh, after a few months after that, we had gradually the grazing of deaths of HIV because they were sharing, you know, sharing their needles and so on. So this is the causes of the causes. We know that. We are, so we are pro uh, the crisis produced a very sharp ri rise in mortality and morbidity. That means a very sharp rise in needs for care. So how we reply to that, uh, that reality that we have needs of care? We, we reply, and this is uh, ex exactly the adjustment pol programs. You see the economic a EAPs, economic adjusted programs, which are, are imposing IMF, the European Bank, and so on. They are impo imposing uh, the austerity policies, which are that we have to change the healthcare system in a uh, which is was up to now a public health care system, we have to gain money for that. That's why they have introduced a, a co-payment. You see here three to five euros. When, whenever you have an access to the public uh, services, you have to pay, you had to pay five euros. And we are going to discuss that after the words, what that means. And, uh, and uh, fee, fee for prescription, fee for inpatient care and so on. So. A lot, instead of opening the doors to the great needs, we are closing the doors and putting economic uh, obstruct obstructions there. And uh, instead of, of course, growing the functioning of the health services, as you can see here, here we have the, the personnel. And you can see all, all these are the, the personnel, the exit, which means all the people that are out of the service because of uh, pensions and so on. And the black one is just the entry. So you can see the, this one, you see. So you can see this difference. It's enormous difference, which have produced actually a uh, dismantlement of the health services. There are, we, we don't have personnel. We don't have, I mean, there are services, for example, intensive care 
beds that are closing down because we don't have personnel to function them. So instead of uh, replying to these needs, we are closing down the services. And of course, this is the other part of the same coin of the neoliberal policies of austerity and of structural adjustment, which are producing are uh, producing more gains to the private sector, and they are dismantling the public sector. Uh, under these uh, policies, of course, we have also this I mentioned because we are here, international organization and experts that offer technical assistance for the implementation of these policies. Okay, and you can see, for example, accounting and monitoring Swedish uh, Swedish experts, and you can see hospital management German Ministry of Health. Uh, and you can see the task force for Greece, which are also German. And uh, anyway, you can see all these uh, interesting uh, reforms that are imposed. And you can see that your government, the government of Germany, is quite uh, uh, deeply in implemented in these uh, policies. So uh, the funny, you know, it's not a funny. It's it's this shows how much they are. Uh, mocking at us. I mean, they are saying all these, all these numbers here are the projections of the Troika. That, okay, if we make this program of austerity, you know, after this, uh, in 2010, you are going to have this development. In so all these lines are projections of the Troika that you have to suffer a bit. And after six months or one year, you are going to have uh, 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 a development, and you can see the actual situation is here. So even the projections are wrong. They are not wrong, actually. I think this is a propaganda. And if, you, if we had time, we could discuss a lot about that, that all this crisis is produced as a propaganda of uh, fundamentalists of neoliberalism. Because all the data, we have a lot of data, internationally, I mean, all the scientific and political community, all the data are proving, as you said before, that the reality is not going there. And they are insisting that the we have to go there for the good of all. O obviously, it's not the good for of all. It's the good for several only small groups of interest, of capitalist interest. So how we, we react to that? First of all, before the series of government, I have to, you ask me, so the f one reaction that we had, because we have seen in, uh, from 2010 that uh, a lot of people ha were in need and no one could help uh, them. So these people were shifting to a very, they, they wanted to find a solution for their own. This is the basis for selfism, which is the basis for fascism. Okay, so everyone for his own. So uh, we thought in Greece generally, and this I think one of the, very positive things that we have to keep as uh, uh, some th the movement that we have to grow in, in Europe. We had a very quickly a solidarity movement, all kinds of solidarity for food. We have solidarity kitchens in the plazas and we are, and solidarity clinics, which is our topic today. I mean, a, a bit of information. Probably you know something. We have discussed that yes, last year also. But anyway, the solidarity clinics are clinics set up by people, so nothing has, the, the, the state had not interfered in any way, and people that are working volunteer in a, in, in a voluntary basis. So we are health workers, but not only health workers, people that are coming and say, okay, I want to, to help. Journalists, and not only, I mean, uh, uh, all kinds of people that are coming and help us organize the, the, so the, the clinic because we, we, we started from the beginning, we wanted to provide a good service, so good quality of service, in good conditions also for the patient, you know. So we have a, a system of organized uh, uh, the appointments, so we don't have queues and so on. Everyone has his, appo his appointment. And actually this does not happen in the services, in the public services, and people are astonished. They say, why do you need an appointment? I can go there. No, you cannot go there. It's better for you because the time you are spending for you, it's much better and so on. So one, uh, one um, uh, aspect of this is that we wanted to provide good quality of services, which means attendance, medical attendance, but not only that. We are also providing drugs, which is actually the bigger issue for the people because they cannot buy the drugs. 
So we have a, a big uh, solidarity campaign in Greece, but also in Europe, and a lot of people are bringing us drugs. And actually, we have some uh, friends and comrades here that uh, last week we had uh, we uh, received a big package of drugs that we needed also. And so it's an international solidarity campaign that we are using the drug. Uh, on the other side, and this is also interesting, we have a lot of drugs that are coming and from other countries, but also from people in Greece, which are drugs and devices that are used only in hospitals. So what we try to do is to, you know, to just, we went to the hospital and said, okay, we have this, do you want to, to take them? And because of bureaucratic administration, they could not accept that. So what we are doing is smuggling in. I mean, because a lot, a lot of people from us are working in, uh, in hospitals, so in the night shifts, we go there and we put some material because it is illegal to, to, to receive it, but it is there. So, you know, we are giving material in an illegal way. And speaking about illegality, we are proud to be illegal. Yes, no, because from the beginning, the state put us some problems, you know, and even the medical order. What are you doing there? I mean, you have a, here, for example, to set up, a, you know, in this room to set up a medical assistant. There is no permission. Why are you doing that? The medical order did, didn't give you a permission and so on. The police, the everyone. And we said, yes, we are illegal. If you want, come and close us. Because it is a movement, okay? It's not just a service. It is a movement where we are trying to make this movement, first of all, to make the patients involved in the movement. So they are coming, they are helping us. A lot of people are helping uh, regarding their speciality. For example, we have a carpenter who is making our chairs and our, you know, so uh, uh, an, an electrician who is in charge of, and, and so on. All these people are our patients, but are not our patients, are our comrades, actually. And it's very important. And the other aspect of the movement is that we are, uh, Having, we are going to all manifestations against austerity and so on. So we are, we are a political movement, a very political movement. And also we are going to hospitals. We are choosing every six months another hospital where we have a lot of patients that they have a problem. They, they need a surgery or whatever. And we go as a massive manifestation in the hospital and we are asking to Mr. Tell patient, you have now to accept him for... Uh, whatever, for a surgery or whatever. So it is a, a hospital demanding for the health services to open, even for free, okay, of course. So this is the idea of the social solidarity cl clinics. Now we have all over Greece. Uh, every social solidarity cl clinic, I repeat, was made by the, it is a grassroots movement, so there is no any direction. But the, uh, we are making now a coordination. Last um, June, we had a, national conference of social solidarity clinics in Corinthos, where we are discussing, we are trying, you know, to organize ourselves. And also, uh, as we have a lot of uh, international solidarity, we, are, we have a common database. So if, for example, something is coming from Berlin and we don't need it in Thessaloniki, we are making this and say, who is needing that? So we are, you know, so we are allocating that to whoever needs that. So this is the, the movement reply. Now, the first period of the, the first series of government, okay, the previous the, from January, as you know, uh, it was a, a change that all of us, we had a, a lot of hopes that we're going to change a lot of things. And um, we tried to reply also to, of course, having health as an important issue. And uh, what happened was that, uh, first of all, the, this I, I, I show you these five euros tickets in order to get into the, the service. The government abolished that. But now this is also a request by the new memorandum. Okay, so we are, today we are in a quite difficult uh, situation. W uh, another thing that um, we, have do we have done, and it is also the challenge for today, is that uh, from the previous government, I was the counselor of the Minister of Health, the, the, the second Minister of Health, and uh, we made a project that we want to relaunch primary care in the Almata spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is to produce, uh, to organize 
a primary care network in all of the country based in a district level. So it, that's why you have to continue to that because we are going to copy a lot of your work. The idea is to have in every district to have a, a, a local primary care unit working for and with the people also, okay? So this was a plan uh, before in the previous. And now, the, because the minister now is who, the person who before he was deputy minister, so he is very keen to, to do that. And this is a challenge. And this perhaps we can discuss that because the situation changed a lot after, as you asked, after the signing of a memorandum. The political situation changed a lot. In Syriza also we have a, some, there was big changes because uh, all these decisions, in my, this is my view now, okay? I'm speaking from myself, from my perspective. All these decisions that were taken during the summer were taken no, I mean, all of us in the party, we knew, we, uh, we, we were informed for these decisions by the media. Okay. This is the main problem, I think, in this situation. So uh, that's why in the elections, and it was written to all newspapers, I don't know if here you heard it, and all the media, the elections were saying that Tsipras won, not Syriza. And this is truth. It is Tsipras. I mean, we have now a new situation where we have a leader, a young, a bright, and so on leader, but it is a leader, and the leader is going on, not a party. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important issue, in my view, mm -hmm. uh, which has also very uh, well-defined limits mm -hmm. to go, okay? If you don't have a party, you don't have a movement, and so on. Anyway, now the challenge is if, we ca if this government, which is produced like this, uh, can make something, some steps can give some as primary care or uh, other uh, for example what the 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 most positive record of this government and the previous gov government are is in the human rights and especially the refugees rights it's a very good positive uh, record because before you know that uh, the, the the governments before were just shooting the refugees when they were coming by the sea and now, of course, this has changed, and all these rights issues are changed. So the idea is that uh, uh, this is the discussion now in Greece, because the assignment was, under, was made under the TINA. The, there is no alternative uh, approach. And now we are starting uh, again saying perhaps there is an alternative, which is another TINA. There is an alternative. And this alternative in uh, uh, in, in my view and our view, is that we have to, to have a so international solidarity, okay? It is important, as you can have seen in Spain, and, and you are going to see all Europe and all the world, the, the, the only real internationalists in the world are the capitalists, okay? They know very well the job, and they are acting very well coordinated. We are not, and we have to understand that if the peoples are not are not united in a, an internationalist way, in the struggle against this ruthless capitalism, we don't have, I mean, we are going really to medieval years. All Europe, it's not a Greek phenomenon. We have to understand that this is, this is a European and worldwide. We are going to the medieval in a very harsh capitalism like the medieval years. So we have to, to act, to react, and to struggle. Thank you. I can continue this issue. <laughs> it, yes, it is very important. No, I, I, I think here we are, I mean, being in Berlin, which is in one way the center of the European capitalism, and being in Rosa Luxemburg, Stiftung, which is the center of the, Rosa Luxemburg at least was the center of uh, the revolution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have to act. Yes, okay, yes. okay. We have to understand, first of all, and I think it's very crucial, you know it, of course, but it is obvious now, all, all the world, that social, social democracies have finished, okay? Social democracy in Greece, not only in Greece, in every country, in Spain also. It was uh, the, the main leading political force implementing neoliberalism even more than the conservatives, okay? So we have to understand that, we have to cut that, and we actually, there are a lot of people, unionists, uh, activists, militants, 
of which are into the social democratic uh, framework that we have to of course not to fight with them but we have to persuade them that they have to go in the left and we have to 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 fight together this is a general issue and the other i repeat i think we are very backwards in international solidarity the problem today is not greek we don't need solidarity for greece in, in terms, you know, as a philanthropy or a charity. Oh, poor Greeks, we have to help them. No, we need solidarity all over Europe. We have to raise, because if we don't raise, you see what is happening now, TTP is coming. What are the roots of Médecins pour le Peuple and um, how are you working? How did the crisis of 2008 and the following years um, influence the society in Belgium? And what do neoliberal politics look like in, in Belgium? Uh, especially in the health sector. Um, do you also have to fight austerity measures at the moment? And how is the relationship between uh, Médecins pour le Peuple and the Workers' Party and the left movement? Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, um, I'm Flemish or Belgian, and we say good evening. Good evening, allemaal. So, uh, okay, I am a family doctor. I'm a mother too. I have two children. And um, I will tell you about my work. It's more like a testimony, but also about our project. So, it's um, uh, the name of our organization is Geneeskunde voor het Volk, or Medicine pour le Peuple. And we can translate it best in English like Doctors for the People. Um, and here, how, it, how can I push? The light. Here is Renia. Renia. Renia was there too. She came to visit us. So that's the team of my medical house where I work. Um, so we were established in 71 and we were an initiative of the Workers' Party of Belgium. Um, med uh, Doctors for the People was like um, an exercise of the implementation of the health program of the party. We want to put an example that it really is possible to organize in a country where the healthcare is merely uh, organized in a private way, that it is possible to organize a very accessible healthcare system. Uh, we are very small. Eh? We uh, only have 11 centers, but which is unique that we are all over the country. So maybe if you know Belgium, we are now like in a separatist uh, move uh, moment. <laughs> and so the, we are uh, 10 million. And so the, in the north, there live 6 million people who speak Dutch. Yeah? Or, uh, and in the south, the people speak uh, French. And they want us to believe that we are different. And in the north, they say that the from the south are lazy, like Greek. <laughs> Etc. that they cost too much, etc., and they want to separate us. And we, as we are a national movement, and we want to go on together in solidarity. We have 25,000 patients, about 110 health workers, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists, psychologists, dietitians, administration, uh, people who work at reception. And we all have around a similar wage, the wage of a worker. Uh, so now I have a slide just because there were I already did a try out of my PowerPoint yesterday with a group of uh, Rania and uh, Kirsten. And so they said it would be interesting for you to explain a little bit who is the Workers' Party of Belgium. So maybe to, to explain you, the people who work in our healthcare centers are not all members of the Workers' Party of Belgium. Mostly the half or more than half are. Eh? But people who are believing in our concept and our project are very welcome to work with us and we work together. But who is the Workers' Party of Belgium? Oh, yes, it will come after us, I think. So these are the 11 houses. No, it's not. It has been changed now, okay. Uh, I have it uh, later on, but I can tell you that uh, we are, now we are a small party, which we are also a national party. So we also go, which is unique in Belgium because the most parties exist only in the north or in the south. So we are, we go together and we have now, since short, we have 10,000 members. So we grow very recently, we grow with many more members. 
We now with, we had with the last uh, council elections uh, for the town's elections, we have uh, now 52 elected people. And uh, all of us, uh, we stay at a, we live with a wage of 1,600 euro a month. So for example, the people we have two in the federal parliament, they win 7,000 euro a month and they give it back to the party to stay uh, equal with the people beside, we are from the people and we want to stay with the people. Um, that's just to explain a little bit. I'm also elected in my district of the city of Antwerp. So I am, uh, beside mother and family doctor, I also represent the people together with the people and of my group in my district. Okay. What do we stand for? We uh, stand for the right to health and to health care, for free and equal access to everyone, and for a patient-centered care, multidisciplinary. Um, we, uh, we are really working not only, we offer not only a very warm and high quality health care in our centers, but also we struggle together with the people for healthy working and living conditions. We want not only, we want people to be to get be stronger to get stronger and to, we want so we empower patients and people and we we think that solidarity international solidarity is very important um, for example what uh, so that we not only stay within our walls we also for example uh, um, use our expertise our um, the fact that we are scientists also to to uh, support, for example, the trade unions, because there was a big struggle in Belgium. Uh, the government wants to delay retirement, that we want, they, they want us to work until the age of 67. You can see here, this was a manifestation, and you see he's uh, representing a nurse with six arms and, you know, in his old days still working. <laughs> so we did an... Um, um, research on our patients and then we saw that uh, the group between 50 and 50 years 55 years old that three in four had one chronic diseases one in three had three or more chronic diseases and especially the women were the most vulnerable so this was it helped the trade unions in the political discussions another uh, study we did was uh, one of our we are also a training center for family doctors so, and uh, uh, Suzanne van der Wiele, she did a very interesting study on our patients. And so she did an inquiry about how people uh, felt about their health. So it was not specially on suicide, but out of this, we saw that 10% of the patients were, had suicidal thoughts. And that because it was in the crisis, that people who had recent job loss, one in four. So it goes together with the situation in Greece. And uh, we had, this was published in a Dutch uh, um, scientific magazine for uh, primary healthcare and also in the British Journal of GP, General Practitioners. So now in Belgium we have huge needs. As a U EU study said last year, and you see here in the newspaper in Belgium, which is very well known, that our, uh, one in 10, or 900,000 Belgians eh, cannot afford to go to the doctor. So. If in a ranking on 31 European countries, Belgium is on the 20th place. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a shame because only two weeks ago, in another ranking, Belgium is the third richest country in the world. And we cannot offer free uh, access to healthcare. It's uh, really a shame. The people with chronic disease, and especially the people with cancer, are the biggest victims. So you know Michael Moore, movie of Sico. Well, why is that? Um, well, we have the highest medical expenses of Europe. 28% people have to pay by themselves, which is 666 euro a year. So uh, one of the consequences is that there is an opening to privatization. So people, that many uh, insurance companies uh, offer hospitalization insurance. So now already, which is really new, 82% of the Belgians have now an insurance and another 20 not. So now the, it, there is a two-velocity system of healthcare going to start. 
And also, as um, Alexis told already, also there is a huge increase of people who are using antidepressiva. Uh, one million now. It's 40% increase the last eight years. Yes, one in 10 Belgian is taking antidepressiva. Sorry, I forgot to translate. <laughs> so it's the general policy of the government. Um, they, now, this government is a right government. Uh, it's together with the liberals and uh, national uh, separatist, demo, uh, government nationalist, separatist, and uh, liberal <laughs> uh, with Bart de Wever. And they want to uh, save uh, 11.2 billion. And as David Suckler said, each hundred dollar that is invested in social uh, sector has a decrease of 1.19% uh, of mortality. So it's, it's the, the way, other way around we should work. Oh, I forgot another thing not to <laughs> translate, is that we say working longer is not feasible. Because again, another, now we did it only with our you know, healthcare centers, but there was a national health inquiry and they discovered the same thing with another age group from 55 to 64 years that already 23% had two chronic diseases. So people in this age group are really used, they are tired of working and it's not a good idea to let people work longer while in the meantime in Belgium there are 600,000 people unemployed. And this is our uh, very healthy looking min Minister of Health, <laughs> Maggie de Bloch. She's a family doctor and she wants to save two billion in the health sector. Uh, yes. <laughs> we say that it's not a solution. All she, um, it, it's, it's the, the patient is a victim because everything she proposed, uh, is more expensive, there, the access is less and the quality is less. There is the threat of privatization and she doesn't touch or she doesn't want to change the exorbitant prices of the pharma business and certain specialists. Health is not a commodity. So this photograph is one of our, our campaigns we did together with the patients. We went to the hospital and we said, for good hospitals who are close by the people or nearby the people. Another campaign we did together with our patients and our health workers was that we said um, in Belgium, um, it, primary health care is not free. We are a very rich country and in 15 of the 27 European countries, it's free. So we said it's not that expensive. We calculated it would only cost 170 million euro to offer free primary health care, which would improve a lot to the health status of many people. And it's out of a budget of one to two billion fam for family medicine. So it's really peanuts, this 170 million. And the total budget of uh, health insurance for us is 25 billion. And it's not really free because our social security system is paid by taxes. So we already have paid for this. 7.35% of our brutal wage is the social contribution to the health sector. Together with our patients, we also participate, you know, we, together with in the big national manifestations with the trade unions, together with our party, we, we want to join them together. So these are some images of, this was November last year, then we were with 120,000 in Brussels. Uh, the other one was, it's a beautiful organization now, uh, uh, also uh, it's a citizen movement. It's called Hart, from Hart, above Hart. Eh? I think you would understand that. And uh, so we were there with really huge, uh, I think we were with 25,000, it was very rainy, we were really pouring, and there were so many people there, sorry. <laughs> okay. Then one of our uh, very nice campaigns is the Cheaper Drugs campaigns, which started in 2004. And it's, uh, it's an example of the way we work. Uh, we always start 
it's, it starts in a consultation room in the cabinet. Uh, uh, a patient comes and he needs, uh, because he has a cardiovascular problems, he needs a simvastatin, a cholesterol lowering drug, and we cannot prescribe it. We say, well, how is this possible? And in where we, we did research it. So we are, we, we always say we use our social stethoscope. So we just not only treat people, but we see them holistically, and we also see them in the social context, the political context. So we said, oh, how is that possible? Then we see some research, and then we, um, we I, I would first, uh, then we discovered the New Zealand model, the Kiwi model. Do you know already the Kiwi model? Okay, I will explain. Uh, you know uh, paracetamol. You, well, in Belgium, there are 15 brands. You have Dafalgan, Panadol, Perdolan, etc. Or you have for Amoxicilline, Clamoxil, Amoxi, uh, Sandos, etc. So you have for, in Belgium, there is the, the, the market is free and every pharmaceutical business can, uh, you know, push together to, uh, to, to also to advise the family doctors, please write this down for me, <laughs> etc. in a paper. So this is really not, uh, so what is happening in New Zealand, that they have a, like a public tender. So they say, we are four million New Zealanders, we need that much of paracetamol, of amoxicillin, of simvastatine, which brand would offer us the best price? If we would do that, so this is an export committee, selects the best product, the decision making is transparent, lowest price public tender, fully reimbursed for patients. In Belgium, we would see for 1.5 billion euro in the social insurance, health insurance. And the people, the patients of themselves, because they wouldn't have to pay anymore, it would be completely free, we would save 1 billion euro. So this was a national campaign, and it was beautiful was that we worked together with the the organization for chronic ill people, the chronic pain patients, with the mutuality, uh, the Zorgverzekeringen, Krankenkasse, I don't know, Zikikas. So we had really, we worked on all market festivals, we really, and then we brought it oh, to our minister here. Uh, we are still campaigning because in Belgium is Brussels, the city of the, the capital of Europe, and there are more than uh, um, uh, 20,000 lobbyists there, and they're pushing <laughs> for, for, yes, for the pharma bees. So, but you see, only the idea of the Kiwi New Zealand model, they made them afraid, and we have this Kiwi knot, we, co we call, you see? Check, we, 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 they were afraid, and they lowered their prices. In the meantime, we, they, the, the Belgian army uses it a long time already, and then we now we have also repayment for the uh, HPV vaccine against cervical cancer. So now adolescent girls get it for free. Before it was 150 euro per vaccine. The influenza vaccine for elderly people also. So there were little victories we had, but we're still campaigning on that. Um, another example of the way we work is that we say we are the doctor of the community. Oh, okay, I, I have to go on. <laughs> So we want to work with uh, Straat, Raad, Straat. We say Straße, Raad, Straße. And uh, for example, one of the examples is that uh, I, uh, the people of my neighborhood, they asked, um, they said, oh, there is this little square which is really dangerous for children. Uh, could you do something? And I said, yes, we can do it together. Huh? If the children make a droning, we can put it on the window campaign, we do a petition, and then you come because you can, you can come and explain it to the council, but when people come, there's very poor democracy, they have not a, a right for an answer. So I can pick this up because I'm elected, I can pick this up the question and they have to answer me. And so we won. The little square, Marsplein is auto vrij, is auto vrij, uh, free for cars. So that's one thing of so. We also won with, uh, they want, we have Sinterklaas, it's like Sint Maarten, I think. They wanted to privatize it, which is really a local festivity. <laughs> they would, would cost uh, 24,000 euro. And so we campaigned again. These are very local initiatives. But what we try to do is make a participation of the democracy and empower people. So this is the, the link. Uh, we have also we are work. We are international solidarity. So you can see we have this uh, for Greece. We are supporting three uh, healthcare centers in Greece. 
I have it here. And uh, I want also to give it to you, Orgi, solidarity, no to austerity in Spain and in Greece. I want to hear that. And we, one, five of our doctors and nurses went there to visit one month ago. They stayed five days there, they visited, they, came, they, testimo they put some testimony on the internet, on Facebook, and now they're going around in the country telling about Greece, the solidarity, but also because to spread the news about the austerity policy of Europe to uh, arouse the consciousness of the people. We also uh, we want to solidarity with the refugees uh, in Brussels, in Calais, in Palestine. Um, but to conclude, our achievements is that we are really defenders of a different healthcare system, yeah? and our concrete results are like you know, the Kiwi model is, uh, and so ideal. Then I would like to we want to empower patients through arousing, mobilizing, and organizing. I have one example of the way we work, uh, and they loved it last today, so I, I will have to tell it. <laughs> so this, uh, you know Margaret Whitehead, socialist? Yeah, so these circles is about, she is explaining that we are determined by social determinants. I think Alexis would explain it better, but <laughs> so um, you see these different circles. Here is the eight um, sex uh, constitutional factors and individual lifestyle factors influence on social and economic networks, work, environments. But the most important is, you know, the the the, the policy of the government, general socio-economic, cultural, and environmental conditions. So what we try to do is from our p the patient room, the cabinet. We try to work from here and to empower patients and try to work and struggle for change to each level. So I have one example. For example, in Genk, it's which where we have a community health center. The problem was that there was a manufactory which was had very heavy metal pollution. So it was in a densely populated area. There was a pollution of chromium and nickel, 20 30% above the fixed standard. There were concerns of the people. What is the health impact on my children, etc.? What we do was we did a participative research. So we contacted 50% of the inhabitants door to door. What do, do you think? How is your children? How is the health? Oh, I forgot to tell. It started in the consultation room once again. Children with, uh, with uh, respiratory tr problems I said, oh, what's happening? So many children. And then we all social stethoscope. OK, what's happening? What's happening in the neighborhood? And then we went further on. So you can see here, uh, all these dias again, they're gone again. <laughs> OK, one second. I can change it. They, told, they explain. So, the school was in this dangerous area, so together with our doctor who was elected in the council, we could move the school. So we were really working, using our expertise as physicians, but also that we were politically elected, we could also empower this, use our power to change things. So we went to school, was moved. And so you see here the same Margaret Whitehead circles. So you see we did measures of hygiene, we were moving the school, but also the employees were very concerned about their health, but also about our work. So we worked together with the trade unions, and then we changed the, the manufacturer had to change, they had to clean their manufacturing, and also the law changed. So the, the Belgian law had to change and put new uh, scientific measures, mes measurements about what is cadmium, nickel, um, cadmium, chromium, and nickel new levels. So it was really a, a beautiful example of how on each level we try to work on. Okay, it's my last slide. <laughs> so, I want to thank you for your attention.